70s are in listen only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to the next Relo Andes webinar. If you are new to Relo Andes webinars, then welcome. The Relo office is based out of the US Embassy in Lima, Peru. For those who are not familiar with Relo, it is the regional English language office. It is run by Micah Risher, who is the Relo officer, and Marcelo Raffo. English language, the Relo office is in charge of most of South America in anything having to do with English language education and programs. So my name is Maggie Steingraber. I am the English language fellow who is based out of Lima. I am also the point of contact for the for any questions that you may have regarding webinars. So you'll see my name on the confirmation that you got. Any questions or if you want more information about the, the webinars or the information from today, please feel free to contact me. So the webinar software that we use is called Citrix, also known as GoToWebinar. If you have joined us, then you were successful in your registration and you surely got an email from this company confirming your registration. Being that these are webinars for English teachers, we try to stay true to the practice in making them as interactive as possible. So we want to hear from you on your feedback with it, which is again how you can, you can contact me through email. Also throughout, we would like you to interact with us throughout the webinar. So in case you're new to webinars, I just want to take a few minutes in the beginning to walk you through some of the software so that you can see how it's used and throughout the presentation when you're asked you'll you'll know how to work it. So the first thing is as a participant you will surely see this panel on the side of your screen. So you will see that you are muted and your microphone will remain muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If this is distracting for you, you can click on this arrow here to either collapse or expand the panel if you just want to simply watch. There are also different ways that you can engage with us that we will ask throughout the webinar. So the first being the chat box. You can see the chat box down here in this panel. If you have a question for us throughout the webinar, if you're having a technical problem, for example, you can type it in and we will help you with it. If you have a question for the presenter, please feel free to ask at any time throughout the webinar. But just so you know, we will hold questions and answers until the end. There will be time at the end, so feel free to ask questions as they come up but they will be held until the end. So just to practice using the chat box, can everyone just go up to your chat box and just type in a quick hi and where you are joining us from? All right, I see Susan from Buenos Aires. Hello. Good afternoon to Noella, Noelia as well. Maria. All right, we have Luis from Caracas. Maria from Ecuador, Lisa and Piura. All right, excellent. Carlos in Mexico. Brian in Chicago, Lima. All right. Tarapoto, Lima. Venezuela, excellent. All right, perfect. All right, so it seems like you found the chat box. Everyone knows how to use it. Again, throughout the webinar, please feel free. If you're having a technical problem, type it in. If you have a question for the presenter, again, feel free to type it in, but we'll ask them at the end. And throughout the webinar, Teresa, I'll present, our presenter for today, might ask you a few questions. You can also type them in there. All right. So the next tool that we have is hand raising. If you see on your panel this thing that looks like a hand, 
That is so that you can raise your virtual hand. The idea with this being originally intended for just like any other classroom, if you wanted to get the teacher's attention, you would raise your hand. Unfortunately, there are so many of us joining us that if you raise your hand, you might get overlooked. So if you do have a question or you do need any attention, please type it into the chat box and we'll respond to you. But we will be using the hand raising just for taking quick yes, no polls, just seeing how many of you might have experience with one thing or another. So just to make sure that you know how to raise your hand, please click on that hand raising and raise your virtual hand so that we can just see that you know how to use it. That's this hand right here. All right, very good. Looks like most of you found it. Okay, excellent. So throughout the presentation, if Teresa does ask you, please raise your hand for whatever reason, that is exactly how you'll do it. All right, I will put hands down and we'll move on to the next tool is a poll. So throughout the webinar as well, we will be asking you some polls just to get some feedback from you on your experiences or your opinions or seeing if you're paying attention. So a poll will come up and you can just click on it right on your screen like a multiple choice question. So here's a sample one for you. Just so we can know a little bit about you. Uh, if you work in the area of education, in which area do you work? So is it primary or secondary school, university, or any other higher education tertiary institute? Are you at a private institute? Do you work in a ministry or other government agency or other? So I'll leave it open for a few seconds. Looks like about half of you have voted, so I'll leave it open for a little bit longer. Just let us know a little bit about your background. All right, and we're at about two-thirds, so a couple more seconds. Great, all right, close it out. And you'll be able to see the results as well. So in what area of education do you work? Looks like a lot of people are at private institutes, about 45%, and another 25% are primary or secondary school teachers. All right. Thank you for that. So the next one is a handout. You cannot see it on the, the control panel that I have for you. Uh, but, on, but you should be able to see one of the panels. For you, it should show up somewhere along here that says handout. And there are five different handouts that are available including the slides for Teresa's presentation today and a couple different handouts and lesson plans. Feel free to download those throughout the webinar. Uh, I will tell you to download them now because once the webinar is over, you will not be able to access them. If you're having a problem with the download and you're not able to get them during the webinar, you can also email me at the end and I'm happy to forward them to you. But they are available now, so if you click on them, they should download to your computer and be sure to save them. And the next one is a survey at the very end of the webinar. Once you close out, a window will pop up that will just be a survey from us just so we can get more information. These webinars, are our intention is for them to help you and to be useful for you. So in order to help us with planning and preparing them, we just want a little more information. It's two quick questions on where you're from and how many people are, are with you in, in watching. A lot of people like to plan viewing parties, which is a great way to watch these with colleagues and share ideas. All right. So, with all of that, we will begin. 
So our presenter today is Teresa. Teresa, are you there? I'm here. All right. Okay. So Teresa, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, where you are? Sure, absolutely. My name is Teresa Troyer, and this year I am an English language fellow out of Bogota, Colombia. And I'm here with my entire family, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, a little bit of background on myself. I've taught for 21 years now. Um, only two gray hairs that I don't think are visible in the picture there. I started my teaching career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Slovakia and came back to the US and swore I would never teach again. And so, of course, I ended up teaching immediately in New York City, um, English at, at the high school level. And since then, I've been teaching English and ESL at the K-12 level in New York and then Ohio. I've also taught um, English to university students and professors in Ohio, but also China and Indonesia, which was awesome. Um, my background educationally, I have a undergraduate degree in creative writing and art history. Um, then I needed a job, so I went into the Peace Corps and taught um, and went back and got a master's in composition and TESOL and then a second master's, um, which was graciously funded through my school district, a master's in education. Okay. And there's my family. So we started thinking a year ago about applying um, to be an English language fellow and I was very happy to be accepted to Bogota. So we left the snowy weather in Ohio and moved to sunny, sometimes, Bogota. Excellent. And what is the topic for your presentation today? If you could tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So today we'll be looking at how to plan backwards to move the students forward. Um, and I'm basing, basing my presentation on lessons that I've seen here, but also my own experience and my own teaching. I know that sometimes it's really hard to keep the end goal in mind um, when we have to do something tomorrow or the next five minutes. And so being able to take that time and really think far ahead to plan backwards um, to make sure that students are reaching the goals that we have set for them and that they need to achieve. Excellent. All right. Well, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. We'll jump in. Um, first, I would like the audience, the listeners, to just reflect on a time when you have met a goal in real life. How did you plan backwards to meet that goal? Okay. So there's my very simple example. If we want to eat at 6 o'clock, we need to go to the store in the morning and then to the park and then start cooking at four. Okay, the point is that we all plan backwards in life and hopefully in our professional lives also. So I'm, I'm hoping today that I can share with you some of the best ideas that I've learned about how to organize this planning backwards that you might already be doing. Okay, we are going to do some hand raising next. Oops, Oops sorry. My okay, there we go. Okay, so the first question on the screen: Raise your hand if you have experience in any way with essential questions. Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down, please. Did you put hands down, Mikey? Yep, they're down. Okay, thank you. Okay, number two, raise your hand if you have experience with project-based learning. Okay, thank you, hands down. Okay, number three, content objectives for a lesson. Okay, hands down, please. Okay, and number four, do you have experience with language objectives? Thank you, hands down, please. And finally, do you have experience with formative assessments? OK, 
Okay, great. Hands down, please. Thank you. If you don't have experience with those things, don't worry. Um, I want you to also look at this webinar as an example of a lesson that was planned backwards from the objectives. So the five items that we just looked at are going to be part of the objectives for this webinar. Okay, there are our objectives. They're in blue and red for a reason. The blue shows us what we are going to learn, and the red shows us how we are going to learn these goals. So you will be able to identify a good essential question, understand the value of collaborative projects for authentic assessment, and you also have an opportunity to practice writing content and language objectives. How we do this, then, is with the support of a graphic organizer for thematic planning, with a project assessment map, and with sample lesson plans and objectives. And I do combine my language and content objectives, as you see here, to show both the what and the how of each lesson. Okay. Please take about 30 seconds to look over this lesson plan. And then I'm going to ask a question, is this a good lesson plan, yes or no? Okay, so take a minute to look at it. Okay, I'm going to move on to the question, which is a poll. All right. Uh, are you able to see the poll on your screen? I can see it. Okay. Good. Then I won't read it out. Oh, I, think, I mean, I see my slide. Is that? Oh, I'm not sure if okay. Oh, no, sorry. I, I want it. So, uh, was the sample a good lesson plan? Yes, <laughs> no, or it has some pieces of a lesson plan. Okay. So we're at about a. Uh, 30% of people have, have put in their opinion. We'll wait okay. a couple more seconds and we'll close it out. Okay, we're at almost okay. 70%. So close it in five, four, three, two, <laughs> last second, three. one, and <laughs> closed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right, right, there it is. All right. So the results, uh, in case you can't see it, Teresa, is a uh, 27% of the people said yes, 7% said no, and 67% said it has some pieces of a lesson plan. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And I, I can see the results, so we're good on that. Okay. In my opinion, and I wrote the lesson plan, so don't worry, you won't hurt my feelings. I think that it has some pieces of a lesson, and we're going to jump into this particular lesson and dissect it more. Okay, so to do so, let's look first at backwards design versus a traditional model of lesson planning. Okay, both of them start with standards. Okay, so I'll highlight here in the middle, whatever your learning standards may be for your situation. Okay, but then the big difference comes when you look at backwards design. It starts with the end learning outcome versus choosing assignments and activities to fill time. Okay. And then you develop assessments before you design activities or assignments and finally focus on the desired goals of each lesson. Okay, so starting from the big picture and working to the daily work. Okay, the other item that's incredibly important here is that student-centered teaching and learning um, is the core of backwards design. Okay, you always want to know who your students are, of course, but backwards design looks at a lot more than their English levels or how many students are in the course. Backwards design helps us get at the intrinsic motivation of our students. Okay, whereas teacher-centered learning I mean, sorry, traditional model is much more teacher-centered. Okay. So let's go back to my sample lesson plan and start to dissect it. So what I see here is 
that the, the plan or the actual timing of the lesson was more of a list of activities rather than activities chosen to reach an objective. Okay, and we will look closely at the objective later on because the objective also needs some work. Okay, another um, facet of this lesson plan that made it more of a traditional plan than a backwards design plan was that the focus was on the teacher input more than on the student output. There was some time for students to talk to a partner, but it wasn't a well-designed activity where students knew exactly what to do or the teacher knew how to measure their talk. Okay. And this goes along with um, the limited interaction that students had with each other. Okay. The teacher here is asking a few students how they would describe the main characters, but not encouraging interaction among students. And then finally, there was a little bit of writing at the end that wasn't directly connected to what the objectives were. Okay. All right. So to come back to the idea that backwards design helps us get at the intrinsic motivation of students by starting with a big idea or an essential question that connects to something that already motivates the students. This helps us start with something that will ensure that um, every lesson we design back from there will be interesting and will be toward a real goal for real communication. Okay, so that big idea, that big question. Students love to talk about men versus women sorts of issues and gender roles, but it's very easy as a teacher to quickly squash that enthusiasm if we start to give students worksheets with fill in the blank, men are, blah, 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 women are, blah, 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 or even asking a question like, who is a famous woman from your country, which we've heard a lot during this, this month, um, International Women's Month. So let's look at what might make better essential questions. Okay, so we have another poll opportunity for you to jump in here. All right, you ready for me to launch it? Ready, yeah. All right. And there we are, it's up. So which of the following is a better essential question? Is brave a masculine or feminine trait? Why are stereotypes helpful or harmful? And how are men and women seen differently in different settings? Leave it open a little longer. We're at about 30% of the people. Okay, very good. All right, about half. About two-thirds, so we'll close it up pretty soon in about five, four, three, <laughs> doing the countdown, adds a, adds a little pressure. Yes. Three, two, and one. All right, close it up. Okay. And you're, <laughs> able, you're able to see the results? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I can see that. So we have um, more than half of our participants choosing C, how are males and females seen in different settings, with 30% choosing B and 13% choosing A. Okay, so I'm going to show the next slide. You're not going to like this answer. Here we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> I chose B for, for my essential question. However, I, I want to say that A, B, or C could definitely open up into huge thematic units and into great um, discussions and activities depending on how you use the question. And so that's the point that I want to get at is how are you going to use the question um, once you feel you have a good essential question or a bigger question. Okay. And this is um, a graphic to show what I mean by these big questions or hot questions, H-O-T, higher order thinking questions. If we take a look at what we're asking students to do at this level of Bloom's taxonomy, where they're creating and evaluating and analyzing, they're going to judge um, based on different criteria, they have to defend a position perhaps. Okay. This is where we want our students to be, even if they are beginners. Their English might be limited, but their thinking is not limited. And so by tapping into 
questions and um, assignments that, that help students explore at this level will be tapping into their intrinsic motivation. Okay, so that's what we mean by asking these big questions, okay, not the questions about what does brave mean, okay, but are men or women more brave, for example. Okay. Okay. And now we'll come back to the idea of how you're going to use that question. So no matter which question you choose, how will you use it? The how is tied here to the outcome. Okay, if we remember back a few slides, backwards design starts here, number one, with the outcome. My favorite outcome for a unit is a project and a collaborative project. Okay, so I'm giving you the example of my lesson plan about gender stereotypes. So in this case, I'm going to ask small groups of students, two or three, maybe four students, to produce a video based on their examination of the question that I chose, why are stereotypes helpful or harmful? But to answer that question, they're going to need to do a lot of different things. Okay. It's not a yes-no question, obviously. Are stereotypes helpful or harmful? Okay. Students could say helpful, <laughs> but if we're looking at a video for them to examine other people's opinion about stereotypes, then we're going to ask them to do a lot of critical thinking. Okay. We're going to ask them to use the language target of adjectives that describe male and female attributes or human attributes, they might come to that conclusion. Okay, and also to do some writing to plan for their video. Okay, so the outcome leads us into planning which skills are going to be important for this unit, and then that lets us plan backward to what the daily content will be. Okay. I want to point out the website at the bottom here bie.org. It is the source for project-based learning. Okay. okay, so here's my lesson plan that I've made some adjustments to now. I've added the essential question, why are stereotypes helpful or harmful? Okay, not are they helpful or harmful, but why are they helpful or harmful? And then I've also added my final product, that's going to be the big summative assessment, okay, small group video. Okay. If you don't have access to video, I did give some other ideas for a skit or even a lesson where students teach the other students okay, to examine what they found out about this question. Keep in mind that students remember about 10% of what you say to them. They will remember about 90% of what they teach to other students. Sometimes I find that as a teacher, I'm trying to do the teaching and the learning, and I need to remember to let the students do the work. Once you do the thinking ahead and the planning, then you will have many, many opportunities for the students to build their language okay, in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And projects help you find um, a real question that students have to explore for a real audience. So please take a moment and reflect on your own teaching or examples that you have seen others use and type in an example of a project that you have used in your class or that you've seen others use successfully for student learning. Okay, I see a social media campaign about the environment. A little fun, a water cycle project. Okay. 
Okay, let's consider the social media campaign, which covers a lot of things that we want projects to do, that there would be a real audience with students working together to answer a real question for, for our world. Okay, thank you. Right. As I said, I've designed the webinar as a lesson plan, so at this point, let's do a midpoint check-in and review our objectives so far. So, so far, you have had the opportunity to identify a good essential question, okay? and you've also had some opportunity to understand the value of collaborative projects not only for teaching, but for the final assessment, too, and authentic assessment. Okay, let us move on to our third objective, then, and take some time to practice writing content and language objectives. Okay. I'll ask you to raise your hand one at a time for these examples. Please raise your hand for number one if you think that this is a good example of a learning objective. <clears throat> Students will study how to give opinions. Okay, raise your hand, please. Okay, put your hands down, please. Okay, number two, students will verbally give their opinions about gender stereotypes using sentence starters. Raise your hands if that's a good learning objective. Okay, hands down, please. Okay, and number three, present adjectives to describe feminine and masculine characteristics. Raise your hands if that's a good learning objective. Okay, hands down, please. Okay, let's take a look at our objectives. Then. Students will study how to give opinions, number one. Okay, what makes this not a good learning objective is that there's no measure for it. Okay, how will I know that students have done this? How will students know that they have studied um, how to give opinions um, in a way that they will be measured on? Okay, number two, as you can see, I've got my blue and red all over it and a big thumbs up. Um, to me, this is an ex a good example of a content and learning objective. Okay, remember the content is in blue and the content and language objective, excuse me. The content is in blue and the language is in red. Okay, so students will verbally give their opinion. Okay, so we know that we're dealing with speaking and we also know that we're dealing with opinion um, sentence structure as far as the language piece is concerned. And we're talking about gender stereotypes. That's our content. Okay. And then I give the support here as well. How are they going to give their opinions? They're going to use some sentence starters. Okay. So I don't just leave the students um, on their own, but I, I definitely give them the supports that they need. And then that also helps me to plan both the activities as well as the assessments throughout the class so that I can see whether students are using those sentence starters or not to give opinions. Okay. And the third objective, present adjectives to describe feminine and masculine characteristics. Okay, the teacher might do this if they're going to present something, okay, but how okay, and why are they doing this? So that would also not be an example of a good, a well-formed objective. Okay. There we go. Sorry, my screen was stuck. Okay. Okay. So as I said, I use my supports in the objective to help me measure student progress along the way. So let's take a look at this cartoon. Okay. So the pilot flies 
five hours east from New York, LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> and they land somewhere, but it's not in London where they said they would be landing. Okay. As a teacher, this would be the equivalent to starting the class and then giving the final assessment okay. without checking in between for how students are doing, what progress they're making toward the objectives. Okay, so I'm sure um, that there's a lot going on in this middle section as the pilot flies due east. There's constant checking, um, not only of his own or her own performance, but checking with peers and constant communication with others, which is something that a lot of times we're cut off from as teachers. Um, we don't always have the opportunity to collaborate with our colleagues. Okay, so through all of that checking throughout the flight, the pilot can be sure that he's going to land where <clears throat> the plane needs to land. Okay. So in teaching, this checking along the way is called the formative assessment. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask Maggie to launch our next poll. Which of the following is an example of a formative assessment? All right, it is up for people to respond to. All right, we got a, about a quarter of the people have voted. Okay. Give it a little <laughs> bit more time. Keep voting. It's very important. It's very important. <laughs> right. We want we want to hear from you. <laughs> Okay, we're at about two thirds, so I'll give it the uh, five second countdown for any okay. any last minute votes. Close it out in five, four, three, two, one. Last chance. And oh, wow, that did, I, when I said that, a lot more people voted actually. All right, and uh, closed. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, the results are fairly split. Um, a few more people chose C, the rubric, but um, we're split between the exit ticket and the 10-point fill-in-the-blank quiz then for a formative assessment. Okay, let's take a look. Um, for me, the exit ticket represents the formative assessment. Okay, it was the option that was not graded in any way. Okay. This is one example of an exit ticket that you might use if you're not familiar with exit tickets. Um, a simple way to gauge student learning at the end of a lesson is to ask students to write three things that they learned, two things that they knew, and one thing that they didn't understand. Okay. But of course you could use exit tickets to ask any question that's related to your objectives for the day. <coughs> At the end of the lesson is not the only time to do a formative assessment. Okay, formative assessments can be used throughout the lesson and they are helpful in doing the following. Okay, they help students really understand the learning goals. So in my example lesson about gender stereotypes, when students are using the sentence starters to give their opinion, okay, in my opinion, I think, etc., that helps me to be able to give them immediate feedback and it helps the student understand if they're really reaching the goal or not of giving their opinion in an effective way. Okay. As I said, it shows both of us evidence of learning okay, and feedback between teachers and students. Feedback is not one way from teacher to students. Okay, informative assessments throughout a lesson lets the teacher learn from the students. Okay, and adjust their teaching accordingly. Okay, these formative assessments also help the students be responsible for their own learning. Okay, asking them the question at the end, what did you learn? Or asking them um, how well they achieved the goal, for example, helps them be more responsible. Okay. And help, formative assessments help students learn from each other. And then critically important, they help the teacher change their instructional design for the next day or for the next unit or for the next minute sometimes. Okay, we are going to look back by repeating some of the steps that we've already done to summarize 
how to organize planning backwards, okay, from this big essential question to the daily objectives. Okay. So again, please take a look at this lesson plan, okay, and I'm going to ask you what is the goal for this lesson. So let me give you some time to look at it. Take 10 more seconds and then I'm going to give you a chance to type in. Try to type in in one or two words, what is the goal for this lesson? Good, keep typing. Yay, I see some very concise answers. Good job. Okay. Awesome, okay. Okay, the answers I'm seeing um, are all completely different. Yay, <laughs> which, which um, is making my point here that the lesson, um, I think from this lesson would be really hard to identify what was the exact goal. Okay, so I'm seeing things like identifying sports activities, describing sports, just sports period. Okay, so let's rethink this lesson. Okay, if the topic is sports, okay, which many of us do have to teach, okay, it's in the standards, um, how can that topic be reimagined in a thematic unit? Okay, so we don't want to start with our activities, remember, we want to start with the essential question. Okay, so Maggie, I'm going to ask you to launch this poll, which would be a better essential question to start planning from. Okay, the poll is open. About 10% of people have voted, 20. About half. Okay. We're at about seventy percent. So I'll give the five second countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, and close it out. Okay. Yay! Okay, good go. job. Oops, thank you. Thank you for just, um, as a group, half of you chose the answer that I would have chosen. Okay, so as a teacher then, that's telling me that I have not um, thoroughly explained essential questions, and so if we had more time, we would delve more into essential questions and examples. Okay, so let's look at these possibilities though here. Oops, didn't mean to do that, sorry. Okay, let's look first at the possibilities before I show which one I chose. Okay, A, if we chose A, what sport is most popular? Possible answers here um, are sort of limited. Okay, and remember for essential questions, we want to get at the higher order thinking skills. Okay, defending and criticizing and comparing, evaluating. Okay, B, why are athletes paid more than teachers? This is a question that I want to know the answer to for myself, <laughs> but um, this could be a big or a small question depending on how you use it. Okay, so remember back to the projects that we looked at and thinking of big outcomes. Okay, this could then be a great essential question. Okay, I'm going to, um, to C just for the next exercise. How can sports change a community? Okay, asking this how question and then tying sports to a community really opens up possibilities for students to explore. 
okay, beyond identifying sports or describing sports. Okay, so if we choose C then as our group, let's imagine a final project that your students might really like to do, okay, our, that focuses on how can sports change a community. Okay, so take just a minute and type in one or two words that describe a project that students might do to examine this question. Okay, keep typing. Oh, nice. Interviews, oral presentations. Aha. Working with biographies of famous athletes, surveying the community, okay, which would include many, many skills um, from reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Video presentations, oh, role playing, fun, reports, flashcards, community research, very nice. Okay, keep typing in. I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide though. Okay, so we've looked at the essential question and then the possible outcome in the form of a project. Okay, so now we're ready to look at day to day objectives. Okay, the skills that the students might be using to reach the large outcome. Okay. So here is a sentence frame for you for how to write content and language objectives. If our question is, how can sports change a community, we're going to look at what students might do on just one day of this large unit. Okay, and here's my example. Content, students will be able to form questions about what sports mean to other people so that um, gets at the interviewing skills that many of you typed in. Okay, and how are they going to do this? I'm going to give them some models from documentary film clips. There are many documentaries about um, the effect of sports in communities. Okay, so I'll give them some models and then ask them to form some questions that they will then use in the community or with their peers. Okay, so you can see that the day-to-day -day work build the large outcome. So to summarize our backwards planning, let me give you a couple of examples and then some more resources too. I used the sports example with a group of teachers um, here in Colombia, and when we opened up the lesson from the list of activities that each took 10 minutes to think instead about what is a big question that we want to know about sports, from there the teachers designed some really great um, final products that led them into backwards planning for the unit and for the days. Okay, so here's one example that the teachers came up with. They were going to ask their students in groups to design an exercise activity that doesn't require time or money. <laughs> I would also like to know about this activity. Okay, but this is something that the students would really have to think about. Okay, it's a challenging question that again gets at their intrinsic motivation. They're not just answering questions that have one answer. They're exploring and expanding their thinking. Okay. And let me give you a couple more examples here too. In the handouts um, that you had a chance to download, I completed the lesson plans that we've been looking at about gender stereotypes. So there's my essential question and the product. And then in the two lesson plans that you have, for beginners and for intermediate students, I have filled in the objectives and then the entire lesson with all of the activities and assessments connected to those objectives. Okay, so please feel free to download those and use those. When I worked with students here, um, we had a great time talking about gender stereotypes. Okay, and finally, thank you so much for joining us. I do want to give credit to my colleague here in Bogota, to Lilia Fernando Rocha, for her um, ideas about writing lesson objectives. She wasn't able to join us today, 
resources that I drew from are the SIOP model. My lesson plans are written in the SIOP um, lesson plan format. So here are two sites to check out much more information about sheltered instruction. Okay. And then the Buck Institute for all things project-based. Okay. Many, many resources there, including the um, project map that you've been seeing here for planning backwards. Okay, if, if you would like to do more research, please check out some of the resources at um, English at State, such as Lesson Planning 101, which was a webinar by the fellow who was in Columbia a couple years before me. Okay, there's also an article in English Teaching Forum about a 10-step process for developing units. Okay, and then finally, the Edutopia website and blog um, is a great source of information for all things, but here's an article about planning backwards. Um, by thinking ahead. Right, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, we still have a few more minutes if anyone has questions. Uh, Andre has already asked a question about if you have any templates that you use for backward planning. Yeah, sure. Okay, and um, I, I can't say enough about the Buck Institute. So go there first and use the project assessment map that I showed to plan your outcome, first of all, and then your skills, and then your daily um, objectives. And then once you're ready to jump in on the daily level, that's when I go to the SIOP model and use their lesson planning templates. Um, because the SIOP model helps you plan for every piece of the lesson from the vocabulary and the materials that you're going to need to how you're going to um, engage the students those first few minutes of class, how you're going to build their background, and then how you're going to have them interact and be assessed throughout the lesson. And Denise just has a question if you could explain what the SIOP model is. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, SIOP um, stands for Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol, and the reason I'm in love with SIOP is because it was not developed by researchers and then handed to teachers. It was developed by researchers going into classes for several years and watching what teachers were doing, and then just organizing all of the good things that teachers were doing already into this format. So there are eight different sections to the SIOP um, lesson, and then each section has um, smaller components under that. Um, but again, it's meant to, to gather all of the best practices of teachers for what works with students learning English, and especially students learning English alongside of content. Okay, and I, I do want to point out that even if you think you're just teaching English, um, you, you have content, whatever your context is, whether you know it's sports or if you're teaching business English, etc. You have that content and you have to mesh the content and the language. Um, I don't think Colombia is alone in a push for bilingualism, but there's also a huge push in Colombia for critical thinking, as well as in the United States. That, that's a major issue right now. And so by planning with the project-based and with the PSYOP models, um, you are encouraging that critical thinking. And Anna has a question on, are there some verbs some or specific verbs that you tend to use when you're developing learning objectives? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Great question. Um, if we go back to the slide on Bloom's taxonomy, those are my favorite verbs. Oops, it's going to take me longer than I thought. Okay, so the um, power verbs, I guess we can call them. So when you want students to um, design and build and construct, okay, these, these are for the, the big final um, product that they're going to, to create or evaluate, analyze, et cetera. Okay, but then from day to day, you might be finding yourself using verbs from um, some of the other levels of Bloom. So it really depends on what the, the language and content is that you're um, working toward that day. And also depending on the level of your students. Okay, so as I said, just because you have beginners doesn't mean that you always want to stay at these levels of blooms. You want to push the students um, higher in their thinking. But for to achieve some goals and to master some language objectives, you, you are going to need to show that students can do listing and finding and naming, um, especially with your beginners. 
right. And Anna just wants to know where you can find other examples. I know you have that slide that has some other resources. Maybe you can show that one more time so people can mm -hmm. can take notes. To the end. Yeah. Yep. There we go. And then uh, we have a few more minutes for some questions. Um, Viviana wanted to know if you could give some examples of formative assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay, so <clears throat> in the, the particular lesson that I was using, I'll, I'll draw from that first. Um, students, the, I'll use the beginners. Um, since it was harder to get at a higher order thing, skill with beginners. Let me use that example. So what I did was ask the students the same question, if stereotypes are helpful or harmful, but we had to do a lot more vocabulary building and scaffolding before we could get to the students giving their opinions. So along the way, some of the formative assessments that I, I used um, were giving each student a different vocabulary word and then laying out pictures, unlabeled pictures that matched those vocabulary words on the table, and then students had to go find the picture that matched their vocabulary words. So for example, the vocabulary was all adjectives. So they had to find a picture that matched um, compassionate or talkative. So that, <clears throat> that was that's a formative assessment along the way. It's letting me see if the students are understanding the, the adjectives. And in this case, the adjectives um, that I chose were cognates. Since I'm working between Spanish and English, it was a little bit easier um, to choose words that looked familiar to the students. Okay, so that also helps me see what their thinking is as well, if they're starting to see patterns in language. So then from those adjectives, um, they put them on the board on a line between masculine and feminine if they thought brave is masculine or feminine, etc. They were allowed to put it wherever they thought it landed. Okay, then my next formative assessment was asking students to agree or disagree. So I would say women are more communicative and they had to move to a corner of the room, um, one corner if they agreed, one corner if they disagreed. So again, I'm getting to see if students um, are understanding the adjectives and then also what their thinking is about them and then in their small groups in the corners, they had the chance to use some sentence starters to give their opinion, okay, why they think women are more talkative, etc. So they, they were able to check each other um, for understanding and language use, and then I was also able to check as I moved around the room. All right, and then I think the last question that we're going to have time for, and maybe if you could just give a little clarification on um, essential questions and how to form sure. them. Okay, yeah, so the essential questions are the, the big questions that you want to start with. So a, a lot of lessons that I've observed are more of a list of activities around a topic. So if we look at the sports example, everything that the students did that day related to sports, okay, but it wasn't connected to something that really mattered to them. If I had asked the students, and I did ask some of the students, why are you doing this, um, they don't have the why. Okay. So even if you have the what and the how of your objective, the essential question gives you that why, and it taps into something that then the students actually want to explore or want to know about. And you want your essential questions to be questions that open up further and further and further, just like we see blooms as an upside down triangle. Um, we don't want to ask questions, are men smarter than women, <laughs> yes or no, we want questions um, that open up really large. So why are men in leadership roles um, more often than women? Okay. Think, things like that that just keep getting bigger and bigger. And as you make the questions, you'll find that you can almost always make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, then you tie that question to whatever your final project is. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Teresa. We are. Oh, thank you.